Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad to be here with you. It's a wonderful organization and a wonderful meeting. Um, I'd like Dr. Debbie to be here. I mean, she says such nice things about my book. We didn't have a deal ahead of time. Uh, but I should tell you that on the airplane here, I tried to download an extra copy of her book to my iPad because I enjoyed it so much in reading it. And I tried to download it and discover that it's not out yet, actually, that I only got a preview. But there is a wonderful book about your calm brain that I highly recommend to you. I treat anxiety disorders patients with much of my clinical time, and I can assure you that paper copy is going to my patients right away. So my topic today is medicine without evolution is like engineering without physics. It's a basic science talk, but I promise it will open your eyes to some of the questions that you've had that you didn't know you had all of your career. Engineers, as you know, learn you know, about materials and how to design bridges and all the rest, and they also learn physics and math in great depth because they're supposed to understand the basics of what they're doing. We doctors also learn how the body works and what to do when it doesn't work, but we don't stop there. We learn basic sciences also. However, there's this basic science missing, evolutionary biology. It's a core basic science, but hardly any of us ever get a chance to learn it. And our question for today is, does this matter? You know the answer, otherwise I wouldn't be talking with you. The answer is, if you want to learn how to avoid natural selection, um, you had better study evolutionary biology. So here we are, 153 years after Darwin published The Origin of Species. Are we there yet in terms of applying these basic ideas to medicine? Not hardly. We have some applications in infectious disease, some we're just beginning to use phylogenetic methods to trace genes and tumors and infectious disease. And of course, there's evolutionary genetics. But this canyon, uh, you heard about the valley of nothing between at the pre previous talk and the chasm. Uh, this is the Grand Canyon dividing medicine from the basic science of evolutionary biology. So 2009 was a great year. And if you really want to be famous Long after you're dead, I recommend that you make your greatest book published when you're 50 years old, so people can celebrate the 200th anniversary of your birth and the 150th anniversary of your great book at the same time. <laughs> um, that is Darwin's accomplishment. Uh, 2009 was 150 years after publication of The Origin of Species. And I would had the privilege of going all over the world to talk at various conferences about evolution and medicine with some of the world's greats, Nobel Prize winners, and all the rest. It was just a, a wonderful experience. But it was also very disturbing. Here are some of the things that I heard from the finest stages in the world. One, I heard several physicians say that adult diseases are common because our ancestors were all dead by age 30, so that natural selection couldn't do anything. I also heard that old age diseases exist because selection can't do anything after menopause. Have you heard that as well? Do maybe even some of you believe that, perhaps? Aging exists, I heard, uh, to make room for new individuals so the species can evolve faster. Cancer arises from mutations that are necessary so that natural selection can improve the species. And finally, new pathogens become mild with time because there's no point in really killing your host. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Um, <laughs> It was only t 10 years ago that I, as a psychiatrist, uh, managed to give a lecture to our infectious disease experts and point out to them, hey, you guys, it doesn't work this way. Actually, natural selection works on pathogens to make them, however virulent, will maximize their spread. Um, it's also quite correct that there is no optimal mutation rate. Natural selection minimizes the mutation rate. It can't get it down to nothing, and therefore we still get things like cancer. Aging does not exist to make room for new individuals. All of these are just really fundamental mistakes of the sort that would make you fail, not even the midterm in my class, but the first quiz. <laughs> and here you had really distinguished smart physicians who just never had a chance to learn evolutionary biology. So why is there this problem of doctors not knowing too much about it? This is a study a couple of us did a few years ago asking the deans of all the medical schools in North America, how many evolutionary biologists do you have on your faculty? Number um, for almost all the schools is zero. Uh, then we asked, what topics do you cover in your curriculum in your medical school? 
Almost all of them said, yes, we do cover antibiotic resistance and virulence evolution and population genetics. But then there are these other things that are so basic in evolutionary biology, you get them you know, not in the second half of the term, but in the first couple of weeks. Things like comparative anatomy and design trade-offs and path dependence. And the most fundamental principle of all in biology, not just in evolutionary medicine, but in biology, is the distinction between proximate and ultimate or evolutionary explanations. And only 5% of medical schools cover this, and a number of deans who are very generous in their time to complete this questionnaire said, what's this? It sounds interesting. I've never heard of it. By the time this talk ends, you will have heard of it. Uh, it's been a go good year for me. It's 20 years after George Williams and I published an article grandly titled The Dawn of Darwinian Medicine, and Science wrote a nice review uh, and, and 20 years on, how is Darwinian medicine doing article just a few months ago. This field is growing very fast, and mainly in the next few minutes, I'm going to just give you a sense for how fast. Um, but first, what is this? Is it some special method of practice, evolutionary medicine? No, not at all. It doesn't tell you how to practice, and there's nothing radical about it of any sort. Um, it just applies a basic science to medicine. It's just like genetic medicine, except the basic science is evolutionary biology, not genetics. So this is the book George Williams and I wrote uh, back in 94. And what's great about this field is so many people have taken it up and tried to find new applications of evolution in medicine. This is an edited volume Steve Stearns and company did. This is more from an anthropological point of view. And both Oxford Press books, that's the second edition of that one. That's the second edition of that one. That is a brand new textbook that came out just two years ago. First book, textbook for the field. And this is a book auf Deutsch, uh, for those of you who might prefer reading in German. <laughs> this is a, a connection diagram showing citations. And the thing that's important about this is that here's medicine, here's evolution. This pointer is a little dim. Here's evolution, and this line didn't exist. 15 years ago at all, and there are new connections coming. Uh, a group of us were invited to the Berlin Institute of Advanced Study to spend a year together trying to see what we could do to advance evolutionary applications in medicine. And one of the main things we came up with is creating an online journal called the Evolution Medicine Review. If you want to know everything about the field, it's all there. Just type in Evolution Medicine Review in Google, and you'll be there. It also made it possible for us to organize a meeting of 80 leading scientists who study exactly how modern environments cause disease. We all talk about this, right? Say, well, you're living in an abnormal environment, that's why we eat too much of the wrong food, and we should like, but we actually had 80 scientists actually get into the nitty gritty of this for the first time. Also a special issue of PNAS on the topic, got a lot of people very interested. And most fun of all is a course that I run at Mount Desert Island in Arcadia National Park. Uh, you are all invited. Um, this, the next version is about infection and cancer in particular. It's about half about evolutionary medicine in general and half about evolution, about infectious disease and cancer. This is our lobster dinner on the ocean that we conclude with. We have a wonderful time. Eight faculty from around the world teach this course for 40 students. So what's the landscape of this evolutionary medicine business? Well, first of all, you don't want that diagram. That's too much to put on a slide, right? But that's supposed to impress you that there are a whole bunch of different topics here, not just the one I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm mainly going to talk about the adaptive significance of um, aspects of the disease that leave us vulnerable. But there are all these other aspects of evolutionary medicine that are equally important. In particular, you saw the three bridges across the Grand Canyon when I showed my first slide. Infectious disease, tracing phylogeny, evolutionary genetics. We're making progress there very nicely. But these new questions that George Williams and I have encouraged people to ask are, why did selection leave our bodies so vulnerable to disease? Most of you have heard about natural selection, and most everybody knows the basic idea. But I find audiences don't have the depth of it, and I'm not going to try to go into it in detail. But the gist of it is Darwin watched a bunch of pigeons and asked himself, so do they all come from the same pigeon stock, becoming that dramatically different? The fan tail and the large one and the puffer and the tiny ones, that they, did they all come from the same stock? If they did, they're almost like different species. Can you see how the thinking would run? This idea of natural selection, it's not even a theory. It's just a principle. Whenever there is heritable variation that influences how many offspring you have, the trait is going to change over the generations. It has to. 
For instance, these are a whole bunch of birds with different shaped beaks. And, oh, I thought I had an extra slide in there. This bird gets its nectar from a particular flower in Hawaii that has a curved um, corolla. So this bird, which is the actual bird right in the middle, that curve is just right. This bird has a beak that's too curved, it can't get the nectar. How many offspring does it have? Not very many, if any. This bird has a beak that's too straight. How much nectar does it get? Almost none. Can you see how the variation within the species leads these birds that have a beak that's curved just right to have more offspring than others, therefore the species gets more like that. Again, a theory, not a theory, but a principle. If individuals vary and certain ones have more offspring than others, the whole species is going to become like that after time. It's got to be that way. So here's the big idea. There are two kinds of explanation we need for everything in biology. One about how things work, and another about how they got that way. Ernst Meyer, the great Harvard evolutionary biologist, says no biological problem is solved until both the proximate and the evolutionary causation has been elucidated. Furthermore, the study of evolutionary causes is as legitimate a part of biology as is the study of the usually physical chemical proximate causes. So what kind of science did we all study in medical school? We studied proximate biology. We never ever got to this whole other half of biology. Two questions, proximate, how does it work? Also, separate question, not an alternative, why is it that way? This is the single most important distinction in biology and is only now being applied to questions in medicine for a very good reason, actually. You know your first two years of medical school, how impressed you were with the nephron and the mitral valve? I mean, wasn't it cool? I mean, it was just unbelievable. You know, you, you can't quite believe it. And then you look at the eye. And you look at the eye and you think, oh my gosh, that's from natural selection? Uh, Darwin looked at the eye and he said, I can hardly believe it. Um, I'm not sure if I believe this, but indeed, uh, it works. Then you got to the second half of medical school in the clinic. Oh my God. I mean, even with the eye, you notice there are cataracts, and there's a blind spot, and there's retinal detachment, and there's glaucoma, and who designed this thing anyhow? It's like it's a botched job. Um, and then you saw in the rest of your clinics, you saw people with breast cancer, and heart disease, and hemorrhoids, and acne. I mean, it's, isn't it cuckoo that some things could be so fabulous, and other things are just screwed up? It's just like the engineers for a Mercedes design plant worked really hard for five days and got it just about right, and then they all went out and got drunk for the sixth day and came back to finish the job. So just a few other examples. Um, you don't need to be a physician to design a better body. Any high school student could. I mean, the first thing you're going to do is get rid of the appendix. <laughs> you don't need it. You really don't. You're going to take out the wisdom teeth. How many of you are glad you have wisdom teeth, really? I mean, no. Um, you are going to turn the eye inside out so that there's no blind spot and no possibility of retinal detachment. Um, you will make the bones stronger so they don't break so much. You will improve the immune responses so that you don't get infectious disease so much. You will certainly make blood clot a little bit more slowly. And, you know, Freud. I risk it with an audience like you, but he said he knew it, or wanted to find out what women want. And we evolutionists know what women want, and they can't ever get it. Uh, they want a zipper uh, so that babies can exit far, far more easily. Um, it's ridiculous that it has to, a baby has to go through that tiny, tiny, narrow circle of bone. It's just ridiculous. So the question, why isn't the body better? If any high school student could make it better, how come we're stuck with all of these things? The old answer that I was taught in medical school is, hey, natural selection's not that great. It's too weak. Got used to it. There are mutations. Things happen. The new answer, which George Williams and I have tried to get people to address, is that there are six different answers, five more, uh, to, about why bodies aren't better. We need to ask evolutionary questions about why the body isn't better. This is a picture of George Williams, my friend and, and dear friend and colleague, deceased two years ago now. Nico Tinbergen, who encouraged people to ask four questions about biology. Ernst Mayer, the quote that you just saw. And this is John Maynard Smith, who inspired many of us. Uh, this is at the occasion of their Crawford Prize Award, the Nobel Prize for Evolutionary Biologists in 1999. 
So when George and I began our work together, we spent months asking each other and talking over beer and coffee. So why did natural selection shape cancer? Why did natural selection shape a narrow birth canal? What good is that? Why did natural selection shape atherosclerosis? And we were kind of smart guys getting serious about this, but we goofed. That was a bad question. Natural selection doesn't shape diseases. Diseases are not useful. When we changed it and started asking, why has natural selection left us vulnerable to this disease? Then we realized we have a very good question that hadn't really been asked systematically before. So disease is not shaped by natural selection. Please don't leave this room and say, Dr. Nessie says disease is useful. I'm not saying that. The traits that make us vulnerable to disease, however, do have evolutionary explanations. This means natural selection can explain maladaptation as well as adaptation. Notice that this is a whole different question for most of our medical research. Most medical research is, why do some people get sick? We're asking why we all get sick, why we all have a narrow birth canal, wisdom teeth, and all the rest. Six possible reasons. First one, we're mismatched with our modern environment. Um, it's nothing like the environment we evolved in, and it's no surprise it makes us sick. Two, competition with other organisms that evolve faster than we do. No wonder we cannot run them. Three, every single trait is a trade-off. Nothing in the body can be perfect. Four, there are constraints on natural selection. There are mutations, just like my professors used to say, hey, it can't do everything. Five, and this is a very disturbing one, organisms are not actually shaped for health or happiness or cooperation or longevity. They're shaped for maximizing reproductive success. And in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you about the feeble sex and why they are so frail and feeble. And finally, defenses and suffering. Defenses and suffering are, in fact, useful. Pain, fever, nausea, vomiting, cough, and diarrhea are useful capacities shaped by natural selection. Now, here I have the challenge. In the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give you a few examples for each of these. Not a single one of them will I claim to prove in you know, one minute each. Um, the idea is to get you thinking and to get you realizing, hey, these questions that we talk about at cocktail parties are very serious scientific questions with implications for medicine and how we practice as physicians. First of all, mismatch. Our bodies are not well suited for this environment. I mean, can you imagine actual humans sitting around tables indoors with temperature controlled lighting and sugary drinks and fatty snacks? And you know what it does to us, um, but we love these things. More recently, there have been dramatic changes in the kinds of diseases that we are treating in our clinics. The epidemiological transition refers to this gigantic collapse of infectious disease just from 1950 to the year 2000. Measles, mumps, tuberculosis, I mean, it's just a miracle. But more than counterbalancing that, we've seen exponential increases in multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, and asthma, all autoimmune diseases. What the heck is going on? The answer is we're not sure yet. And autism. Yeah. And autism, maybe. We can talk about that later. So here's one for you. Most of you tell your patients to keep your cholesterol levels under 200, but a lot of them get heart attacks anyhow. Why? Well, it turns out that if you look in people who are living a more natural human lifestyle, their cholesterol levels are 120 to 130. Now, 200 is nothing like the normal level of cholesterol for humans. How about heart failure? This is one of my favorites. Jennifer Weil, a cardiologist, pointed this out to George and me 20 years ago, and it's really bowled me over. Did you ever stop to think about why it is when the heart is just not pumping enough because of fluid overload? It signals the kidney to retain more fluid? Does that make any sense at all when you have fluid overload for the kidney to retain more fluid? It, 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 we have to fight this with all the tools in our armamentarium to get that fluid off for our patients with congestive failure. But think about in the natural environment. It wasn't hearts failing, it was dehydration that caused lack of filling pressure. And if you're dehydrated, what's the sensible thing for the body to do? The sensible thing is to adjust the nephron so it reabsorbs more, so, or the distal tubule. So isn't that kind of neat to realize why it is that we're fighting the body when we treat congestive heart failure? Then there's breast cancer, the scourge, at least 10 times, not only one out of every 10 women, but 10 times more frequent now than it used to be a thousand years ago, maybe even just a few hundred years ago. 
What other, is it the plastics that we get in our tin cans or something? Maybe slightly, but there's two bigger factors that are important. Uh, the biggest one is probably simple hormone exposure. My colleague Beverly Strassman uh, has done studies on a tribe in Africa where there is no birth control. The average woman there has about 100 menstrual cycles for an entire lifetime. Um, this is a diagram showing the number of menstrual cycles um, in, in the reproductive years, ages 20 to 30 or something like that. Um, number of menses per, year, per woman for two years averages about two or three because they're nursing or pregnant almost all the time. Um, in the United States, however, it's 300 plus to 400 on the average. The system was just never ever designed for that kind of exposure to hormones. This is a very dramatic slide from a Polish researcher uh, looking at progesterone. You heard in the previous talk just what a problem progesterone is, and this really confirms it. If you look in different countries at the rates of breast cancer and the mid-luteal progesterone concentration, you get just about a straight line. That's as dramatic as you could possibly get, at least showing doubled rates of breast cancer as a direct function. So people living in more ancestral environments where the progesterone levels are dramatically lower because of exercise, diet, and patterns of reproduction have breast cancer rates that are much lower. But that's not the whole story, and one of the complications here is there are many things that come into play. One of my favorites is a study that was done in Norwegian blind women that showed that the blind women who were totally blind had breast cancer rates that were about half of those who had some vision. And these women who had some vision were leaving the lights on at night, and even though they couldn't see, their melatonin was suppressed. These women, because they were totally blind, had high levels of melatonin. And this was confirmed in a very fancy study with double circulation between two rats, one of which was exposed to light and one of which was not. And there's a big opportunity here for us to try not to sleep with the lights on. And one of the disturbing follow-up studies from this was on nurses who work shift work. Uh, who are more at risk of breast cancer perhaps because of that shift work. Same thing for men in their prostate cancer. Scary slide with atheroma, but I already told you the punchline there about the levels of cholesterol. Every single week in the New York Times, there's a new article saying, we found the genes for you know, this or that or the other thing, atherosclerosis and ADHD and obesity and depression and anxiety, everything. Do you believe that? Do you believe that all of those are genetic diseases caused by abnormal genes? Um, there are a whole lot of genes that didn't do anything bad to us in the natural environment. They're only bad when you get to sit quietly and eat McDonald's hamburgers much of the day. <laughs> this leads to a very disturbing conclusion that we all as physicians need to teach our students. Just because something is heritable and highly genetic does not mean it's caused by abnormal genes. In fact, Usually it means it's not caused by abnormal genes. It's caused by genes that are just fine in the natural environment, and their variations expressed only when they interact with aspects of the modern environment. The best example of all, come on, change slides. I may need some AV help here. This, oh, here it goes. Must have been just a big image. Well, I mean, did you ever stop and ask yourself why this heritable disease of myopia is so common and still around after natural selection? If you have nearsightedness like I do, and I can see some of you do, and you were on the African savanna on an afternoon like this, you would be doing something like saying, oh, hello, kitty. Um, and you would very soon be lying lunch. Um, that would be selected against very powerfully. Oh, now I really, out. Before you touch it, before you touch anything. Oh. He has the magic button. This is black screen. Mm, okay. yes. ah. Thank you. In any case, why? Are there these genes for myopia that cause such a terrible problem? Answer, um, it's not a problem in the ancestral environment. You have to read early in light, life or do something in a modern environment for those genes to have any bad effect at all. Hunter-gatherers do not have myopia. Then there's a hygiene hypothesis. You've heard about it in general, but do you have any idea how powerful it was? Think for a moment. What percentage of us in this room 200 years ago would have worms in our gut? Answer, all of us. Those worms evolved to downregulate aspects of our immune system so that they could stay there safely. Our bodies are expecting those chemicals from the worms to downregulate our immune system because it's been, they've been with us for millions of years. Take the worms out, and the body is missing something that it's very badly expecting to get. Not only 
diabetes, Crohn's disease, and asthma. But Mel Greaves, an expert on evolution and cancer, suggests that cancer rates would be cut by half if people lived in a dirtier environment. <laughs> and in England, there are many nursery schools you can go to, and they advertise on their front window, we never vacuum our carpets. Um, it's quite a, come on. So this is a, a brave physician who decided to try this with his patients with Crohn's disease, and he gave them pig whipworms. He administered live eggs of pig whipworms and got remissions in about two-thirds of his cases for Crohn's disease. Um, the FDA is not quite ready to approve this. <laughs> but when you think about it, we've had these things in us for you know, millennia. Um, I think pharmaceutical companies will find other ways to stimulate IL-10, which is a crucial cytokine here, but we're, we're only getting there slowly. Multiple sclerosis is even more dramatic. Why is it in increasing so much? I'm not sure it's because of lack of worms, but it's very clear that if you take two populations, one of which has worms and the other of which does not, has worms and the other of which doesn't, the ones who are infected have vastly higher levels of IL-10 and almost no progression of their multiple sclerosis, while those who do not have worms have steady progression of their disease. This is gigantic. This is not easy science. Uh, pause here just a moment for another hypothesis that made the rounds in all the best newspapers in the world of a fellow who said type 1 diabetes is an adaptation that's useful because it protects your tissues against damage from ice during the ice age. The evidence for this is that these genes are more common in northern Europe than southern Europe and that many animals have high levels of glucose in the, in the winter to protect themselves from damage. So I heard about this and I told the newspaper editor are you kidding me? Uh, don't you know about diabetes type 1? It like kills you, uh, which harms your reproductive success a lot. Uh, these genes would be selected against. This is senseless. This is crazy. But it's very hard for people to judge research hypotheses in this field. And as a result, this was published. My point is this is very difficult science. You can't just go making up things and say it's right. You've, you've got to really pause and think about all the alternatives and do tests to try to figure out which are true and which are false. Competition with other organisms, it's obvious enough. We evolve 40,000 times more slowly than an E. coli. It's amazing that they don't just eat us up. Um, you also, also know about antibiotic resistance from your experience and your practices. And when my kids were young, strep pneumonia was nothing. Now it's half of kids are getting resistant strains. You, you know the story here. But here's an interesting one. Where does this resistance come from? This was a study done on 480 samples of soil bacteria from around the world to ask how many bacteria, these bac how many antibiotics these bacteria were resistant to. On the average, they were resistant to seven or eight antibiotics. What is going on? Have, have people been going all around the world and peeing on the dirt so much that the antibiotics have penetrated the soil? No. Um, the bacteria, we get our antibiotics from bacteria because they've been involved in arms races with each other, not for a million years, not for 10 million years, but for hundreds of millions of years. And that's why we get antibiotics from bacteria and fungi. Sometimes physicians think they're going to do an evolutionary kind of thing without knowing what they're doing. Um, some physicians had thought maybe they would have all of their patients in their hospital get the same first choice antibiotic for six months. And then all the doctors would agree to a different first choice antibiotic for the next six months, and another one for the next six months, and then they'd cycle back. The idea being they'd prevent resistance uh, to these antibiotics. But Carl Bergstrom is a friend of mine and a mathematical evolutionary biologist who cranked the math, which is what you have to do. And he demonstrated that this scheme, come up with by very well-meaning doctors, was one of the fastest ways possible to develop multidrug resistance. So again, this is not just for amateurs. This is, you, we really need to collaborate with our evolutionary biologists, basic scientists, colleagues. Unfortunately, most in medicine don't even use the E word. Um, evolution is the word for antibiotic resistance, and in proper medical journals, it's used all the time. In medical journals, it's used about 10% of the time. I don't know what doctors have against science and evolution, but um, it's for some odd reason we just don't use it. Here's a really favorite one, a new one. About 15% of the sugars, oligosaccharides in human breast milk in the first few weeks of life cannot be digested by the baby. Doesn't that sound weird? Every time you see something weird like that, your evolutionary antenna should go up and you think, 
uh-oh, there's something interesting going on here. What the heck is that? Turns out that those milk sugars are easily digested by bifido. By bifido, I suppose is the proper pronunciation, which are the good bacteria that you want to colonize your gut. So they get a head start. Pathogenic bacteria can't digest them. Isn't that neat? It even looks as if breast milk has bifido concentrated in it in the first week of life, specifically to prime the baby with both these, pro the, these oligosaccharides and the bifido. Um, Well-meaning doctors, again, sometimes have taken breast milk and sterilized it to protect the baby. Excuse me. Um, the body knows what it's doing. Please don't mess it up. You all know what a Collie's fracture is, but you ever stop to think about why it's always a break right there at the head? Why not here? Why not here? Why? And the answer is that every single trait in the body is a trade-off. If that bone was thicker, you would try to throw something, and you'd go, ugh. Or you'd try to turst your wrist, and, you'd go, and you wouldn't be able to do this wonderful moment. You'd go, ugh, ugh, ugh. Um, it's a trade-off. You could have it thicker, but at a price. Gout is a good one. Why didn't natural selection lower our uric acid concentrations, for goodness sake? It's heritable. Why didn't it just go lower? So Williams and I, in our book, went way out of a limb, and we said, you know what? We've read in biochemistry textbooks that uric acid is a pretty good antioxidant. Maybe for a long-lived species, it has advantages. It turns out that these things all need testing. This one can be tested using the comparative method. If that's true, then you would expect that primates that have longer lifespans would have higher uric acid levels. Lo and behold, it's exactly the case. Isn't that neat? Here's another one for you. Why is there bilirubin? Do you ever think about how weird it is that there's bilirubin? I mean, we all learn it's a heme breakdown product and blah, blah, blah. But think about it for a second. Um, heme goes to biliverdin. Biliverdin is more water soluble than bilirubin and less toxic. So if we need to get rid of something, why not just get it out right then? But no, the body spends energy and creates bilirubin. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Until you think about it with your evolutionary hat on. Turns out bilirubin also is a very fine antioxidant, very good for a long-lived species. How can you test this idea? You could do a knockout experiment. Knockout experiments are evolutionary experiments about the function of a gene. And in this case, bilirubin, if you knock out that pathway, you very quickly kill the cell. Because every time that cycle goes around normally, it wipes out a reactive oxygen species. And when it's not allowed to go around, the cell dies from oxidative damage. You may have noticed that your patients with hereditary syndromes that involve high levels of bilirubin have heart attack rates one half of that of other people. Really neat stuff. How about beta amyloid? This is bad, right? We all know we do not want beta amyloid in our brains. Uh, it's very highly correlated with Alzheimer's disease. And Lilly, over the last decade, put hundreds of millions of dollars into a compound that decreased the ability to synthesize beta amyloid. It was great hope for this. I was hopeful, too. But when they actually did their partial analysis partial way through the trial, they discovered that the patients who were taking this drug were deteriorating faster. And they had to stop the trial. At the same time, as that was announced, another article was published looking at Bisocia, who did a, a simple experiment. He ground up Alzheimer's brains and plated them out. Found out that they were antimicrobial. Then he took pure beta amyloid. It's a pretty good antimicrobial itself. And then in the definitive experiment, he did a reverse sequence of beta amyloid. The reverse sequence beta amyloid is not an antimicrobial. This doesn't conclude much of anything, except there's something interesting going on here that we need to attend to in our search for solutions to Alzheimer's disease. There's a simpler one by my friend Mark Thomas, a geneticist at University College London. He had the hypothesis, hey, people in certain areas have been living in big cities vulnerable to tuberculosis for 1,000 years now. Are they protected against tuberculosis? And lo and behold, uh, this particular locus is inverted, and people, and, and people who have an inverted locus are protected against tuberculosis, and it's vastly more common in population centers in London, in large cities there, and in large cities in Asia compared to other places. Selection for protection against tuberculosis. Everyone knows the lactase story. Uh, Thomas and his colleagues have also shown me, you all know that being able to digest milk is abnormal, or at least a modern kind of thing that happens only mainly in Europeans. How did they get started? 
Well, if you're in a herding culture in that part of Europe, your selective advantage if you can digest lactase is 20%. People on the average would have 12 children instead of 10 uh, if they had lactase persistence. Those populations grew so quickly that those people moved up north into Scandinavia where now everybody can digest milk, not because they've had cows in Denmark all this time, but because the other populations in southern Europe grew so fast. So a lot of things natural selection just can't do. Mutations happen. Um, if whales had never decided to take a load off their feet and go for a swim, uh, there wouldn't be any whales. <laughs> However, if our eyes had evolved a little bit differently, we wouldn't have a blind spot or the possibility of retinal detachment. Um, an octopus has a normal eye, a good eye, where there isn't any detachment. They don't have any blind spot. All the vessels and nerves come right through the back of the eyeball where they're needed. Can you imagine a camera designer putting all the wires between the light and the film? No, but that's what our eye is like. Ridiculous design. How come our eye is screwed up like that and the octopus eye is right? And the answer is bad luck, just bad luck a few hundred million years ago. Then there's cancer. Um, all kinds of constraints and trade-offs are involved, and this is the hottest area in evolutionary medicine now. Clonal evolution, we're able to trace subunits of a cancer to identify how selection is working. Here's a fact for you. What percentage of cells in a tumor survive? Out of all new cells, maybe 1% survive. All the rest are killed. That's fascinating. There's evolution going on in that tumor all the time. And the newest approach to really thinking deeply about cancer is to change the ecosystem so that the new cells can't survive, not necessarily just to kill everybody off. Next, health is not selection's goal. Selection maximizes reproduction and antagonistic pleiotropy. I'll skip that. For, I'll just talk about the vulnerable sex. I've offered this before. Very important to you, I think. Um, a friend and I decided we would calculate the mortality ratio. For every 100 women who die at a certain age, how many men die? When I went into this research project, I, it seemed to me like maybe the men died somewhat sooner because I had been visiting my mother-in-law at a nursing home and there were not very many guys around. <laughs> so I thought maybe there were 120 women who died for every man who died, but then we got data from World Health Organization, analyzed it, and what we discovered really knocked my socks off. Even before puberty, 150 women are dying compared to every 100 men, and at the peak, of health, age 20 to 25, 300 men are dying for every woman who die. And this is not just the United States. This is for, true for 20 countries. We have a whole bunch of papers about this looking at which factors they are. It's all medical disorders except for Alzheimer's disease. 19 of them are men are more vulnerable. You've got to ask why. In evolutionary terms, investing more in protecting your tissues and repairing them pays off better for females than for males in any species where there's male-male competition for mates. It's a longer argument to make that full, but men are shaped by natural selection to have bodies that just don't preserve themselves that well. This is a graph for the 20th century showing that back in 1900, you didn't see this effect. Why? Because a lot of women were dying in childbirth. That's why. And everybody was dying from infection. But as you get towards the present, you get this huge peak of men dying in early life. Lastly, defenses and suffering. You probably know it, but may not have thought about it clearly enough that pain, fever, nausea, and vomiting are useful. Darwin recognized this kind of thing, saying pain or suffering lessens the power of action, yet it's well adapted to make a creature guard itself against any great or sudden evil. My field is psychiatry, and I've spent a lot of time doing general medicine as well as a consultant living with internists and the patients. And you know what? It's really hard a lot of times to see the suffering of our patients, and you wonder, who the heck designed these systems that regulate pain and anxiety and nausea and vomiting and all the rest? My philosopher friend who has the right take on this, I think, is Schopenhauer, who says, if the immediate and direct purpose of our life is not suffering, then our existence is the most ill-adapted to its purpose <laughs> in the world. It's not quite that bad, is it? But it's pretty bad. So seizures, cancer, paralysis, jaundice, those are defects in the body. It's not working right. Fever, cough, pain, fatigue, and anxiety, those are defenses shaped by natural selection with systems to regulate them. Fever is useful even in cold-blooded animals. And it doesn't seem like it's useful because we can block it and people still live. But that's the question. If natural selection is so great, 
why aren't there patients dying on our doorsteps as soon as they leave our offices? Because a lot of what we do in general medicine is block perfectly normal defenses. People come in with suffering, we can't necessarily say exactly what's wrong, but we relieve their cough, relieve their vomiting, relieve their pain, relieve their fever, relieve their anxiety, and they appreciate it, and it's a wonderful thing. But how come natural selection didn't do it better? The answer is the smoke detector principle. How many times when your smoke detector goes off is it a fire? Not very many. Do you throw the smoke detector out because it has false alarms? No. Why not? Because a false alarm is cheap, and dying in a fire is really, really bad. You want something to go off a lot of false alarms before that catches you. It's fancy signal detection theory that I won't go into here that allows you to calculate exactly what the response threshold should be for pain, fever, nausea, or vomiting. But let's make it simpler. If that fellow is coming towards you, should you run? Yes. <laughs> if you hear a small noise behind a rock at a watering hole in Africa, and then noise is something like, rrr, rrr, it could be a lion, uh, or it could be uh, a monkey or a mouse. Should you run? You're thirsty. You've got to think about this for a minute. Let's do the calculation. The cost of fleeing is 200 calories. The cost of not fleeing, if it's a lion, is 200,000 calories. <laughs> it's optimal to flee whenever the probability of there being a lion is greater than 1 in 1,000. And that means that 999 times out of 1,000, having a panic attack is not necessary but it's perfectly normal. This, this is very practical stuff in the clinic, especially for those of you who treat panic disorder like I do. I had thought before doing, ooh, before doing this calculation that my patients, hey, you've been in the grocery store four times this week and you didn't, nothing bad happened. What's wrong? Now I realize this is what's wrong. The system is set to go off with lots of false alarms. This is also the case for pain, fever, nausea, vomiting, and all the rest. Inflammation. When you're treating someone with influenza in the CCU, um, should you block their inflammatory response or not? It depends. I really appreciated what you said about you know, treating people as individuals with regards to hormone treatment. Exactly the same for everything. And evolution allows us as physicians to think instead of just following mindless algorithms. Lima and Dill really point out that being killed greatly decreases your fitness. Um, <laughs> Point, smoke detector principle, false alarms are normal. Here's one for you. Why do women have twice as much anxiety as men? It's not just the United States, it's all around the world, and it's most kinds of anxiety. And most psychiatrists say, what's wrong with women? Can you guess what an evolutionary biology take on this is? What's wrong with men? It's very clear. Uh, it's very clear that the amount of anxiety in women is very close to optimal. Uh, and the amount in men is lowered so that they can do crazy competitive things that are good for their genes, but bad for them and bad for other people too. <laughs> so wrapping up here, why isn't the body better? There are six good evolutionary reasons. Uh, infection, they evolve faster than we do. Mismatch, we're living in an environment we're never prepared for. Trade-offs, nothing in the body can be perfect. Constraints, a lot of things natural selection can't do, like start over again. Selection is not for health, actually. It's for maximizing reproduction. And finally, defenses and the smoke detector principle. The point here is that every disease needs an evolutionary explanation in terms of why we're vulnerable to it, in addition to approximate explanation about what's wrong in the mechanism of the body. So what evolution offers medicine is yet to come for the most part. We do explanations for vulnerability, evolutionary genetics, phylogenetic methods, infectious disease advances. But most of all, I think it organizes the 10,000 facts we all have to learn into something that's more coherent. Instead of just memorizing them all, they begin to make more sense. I mean, what if you had known what Billy Rubin was for when you memorized those pathways? Wouldn't it just be a whole lot better? And finally, I would suggest it gives you a feeling for the organism. Instead of just this machine-like device, um, an evolutionary view helps you realize that our bodies are very different from machines. They're shaped by natural selection. They're better than any machine could be in some ways, and they're way worse than any machine designed by a 10-year-old in other ways. This is an editorial some of us had in science a little while ago. Bottom line, engineers need to understand physics. Doctors need to understand evolution. And we have a lot of work to do to get that to happen. Thanks very much.
So I left out a little, I left out a little chunk of that talk so there'd be time for a few questions. Thank you for this wonderful talk. I, Louder, I just please. want to make a, <laughs> make a comment about when... Could you hold the microphone right up? Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I, I'm Chinese trained um, physicians and when the SAR broke out in China, there were a lot of deaths, the whole world was panicking. And the only thing, you know, happened to my mind is, I, I share with a lot of my colleagues uh, was that uh, in China, if a physician doesn't prescribe antibiotics uh, to any fevers or any symptoms, people walked in, it's considered um, not caring or just in, in Chinatown, this happens very to often something. too. And they want you, if the doctor prescribed antibiotics, that's considered a good doctor. Some people go through back door to get antibiotics, penicillin, any other um, antibiotics is prescribed. So apparently for for pretty much minor virus infections. And the other things, I, I just thought about this now, I need to mention this just to let everybody aware, at least that's my hypothesis. And the other thing is, in Chinese medicine, there's a lot of mm, immune supposedly boosters and people use those herbs medicines and they use it when they have some symptoms. I, I, I just feel like those two factors may have, uh, would especially the antibiotics using in, you right. know. So, so the question is about SARS making the jump uh, from civets or other things to humans Some and why it was so incredibly fatal, maybe because of lots of antibiotic use in China or maybe because of herbal use. I'm not sure how to answer that one. That's a whole separate, you know, empirical question. But I'm delighted that the FDA just in the last week has restricted the use of antibiotics at farm animals very, very slightly. Uh, very slightly. Uh, they've insisted that veterinarians prescribe them instead of letting farmers just use them. I think everybody's going to get a friendly veterinarian to write a prescription for everything they need. And if you're a farmer, you can't really compete without using antibiotics in those animals where you get extra weight gain. This is a huge social problem, and the companies that manufacture them and make profits off them are competing with each other, and they can't just give up their markets and still survive. It's a terrible social problem. Um, We'll have to see if we can do something about that. Please. Oh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, would you care to comment on the, what I believe to be excessive use of these antibacterial hand washes that we are seeing all over the place? Right. Uh, as a surgeon, I am sick and tired of washing my hands every time I touch a keyboard before I touch somebody's head to move it around and look in their ear. Triclosan, of course, is the big one in most of our soaps and antibiotics, and it certainly does lead to resistance of some sorts. I've read about this, and I haven't been able to reach a really firm conclusion. You oh, know, I, I wish I could. Great talk, otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You, you, you know, I, th I think the big danger for the field of evolutionary medicine is people, you know, taking and going directly from theory to clinical recommendations, and that's just going to kill it. I think every single one of these things, we've, we, you come up with different ideas. I mean, the evolution says, hey, we probably shouldn't use anything like that regularly. It's screwing up the flora on our skin. And who knows if that's not only you know, increasing antibiotic resistance, but possibly increasing rates of skin cancer. You should consider all kinds of complications from things like that. But I do not want anyone making clinical recommendations directly on the basis of theory. I think every one of these things needs to be studied on its own merits. Thank you. On to the next. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.